Welcome, fellow wordsmiths, to a world of imagination and storytelling. Let's dive into the depths of creativity as we unravel the intricate layers of the Kite Runner by Khalil Hosseini. Chapter 1 This chapter begins in December of 2001. Amir recalls the exact moment that was to forever shape his destiny. He says he was 12 and crouched in an alley and that he has never been able to fully bury that day in his past. He now lives in San Francisco and he ends a phone call and takes a walk, noting the kites in the air at Golden Gate Park. Amir sits and thinks back on his past and the day that made him into the man he is now. Chapter 2 In Chapter 2, Amir and Hassan are children together. They spend time playing as young boys did in this time in their Afghanistan home of Kabul. Hassan has a hair lip and is teased unmercifully by the other children. Hassan's father, Ali, chastises the boys when he catches them at mischief, and Hassan never reveals that the mischief is always Amir's idea. Amir and his father, who he calls Baba, live in a nice house in a wealthy neighborhood. Hassan and Ali, servants of the household, live in mud huts in the back. Baba's best friend and business partner is Rahim Khan. Hassan is one year younger than Amir. Hassan is one year younger than Amir. Amir's mother died in childbirth. Hassan's mother, Sanobar, ran away a week after his birth. Hassan never mentions his mother, but a midwife said Sanobar had taken one look at Hassan's cleft lip and declared him an idiot to match Allah. Chapter 3 Amir says his father had once wrestled a black bear. He says the story might have been put down to the tendency of the Afghan people to exaggerate, but the fact that it was Baba means the story is true. In the late 1960s, Baba builds an orphanage, financing, and overseeing the entire project. One way, Amir comes home from school after having been told by a teacher that drinking is a horrible sin. He relates that to his father, who is having a glass of whiskey. Baba tells Amir that there is only one serious sin, the theft. He says there are versions of that sin. Such a lying because that robs someone of the truth, and murder because that robs someone of life. Baba says the teachers are bearded monkeys, and that Amir will not get a true education from them. Baba then says that if there's a god out there, he has better things to do than to worry about someone who drinks liquor. Amir says he knows his father is disappointed in him. Baba often ignores Amir's conversations. Once Amir says he has cancer and Baba tells him to get a soda, Amir believes Baba hates him on some level because Baba's beautiful wife died in childbirth, died in childbirth giving life to Amir. Amir says... He is nothing like his father and prefers the written word to the pursuits Baba enjoys, such as hunting. One day, Amir hears Baba talking with Rahim Khan. Baba says there's something missing in Amir. Rahim Khan says Baba doesn't get to make Amir into what he wants and that there's nothing wrong with Amir. He says all that's missing in Amir is a mean streak. Baba says doesn't stand up for himself when the neighborhood boys pick on him, letting Hassan defend him. Baba predicts Amir will become a man who can't stand up to anything. The following morning, Hassan is preparing Amir's breakfast and asks what's wrong. Amir snaps at Hassan and realizes he's being mean, though Rahim Khan had said Amir doesn't have what it takes to be mean. Chapter 4 Amir recounts the story of how Ali came to be a member of the household. Amir's grandfather was a judge in 1933, the year Baba was born. A pair of men had struck and killed a couple, leaving their five-year-old son an orphan. That boy was Ali and Amir's grandfather had taken the boy into his house. Amir says Baba has many stories about the mischief he and Ali caused as children. Ali says, Baba came up with the ideas and he merely carried out Baba's plan. Each day during the school year, 
Hassan does chores while Baba drives Amir to school in his black Ford Mustang. After school, Amir and Hassan head to an abandoned cemetery where they eat pomegranates from a tree and Amir reads to Hassan. One day, Amir stops reading the story in the book and begins making up a story instead. When he's finished, Hassan applauds, saying he liked the story very much. Amir is amazed at the discovery, and that night, he writes a short story about a man who learns that if he cries into a magic cup, the tears turn to pearls. In an effort to make himself cry, he goes to extremes, eventually killing his wife. Amir takes the story to his father's study, where Baba isn't interested, but Rahim Khan asks to read it. When Rahim Khan returns the story, he's written a note of encouragement saying, Amir has talent. Then he and Baba leave for the evening. When Amir reads it to Hassan, he echoes the praise, predicting Amir will someday become a famous writer. Then Hassan points out that the man might have simply smelled an onion and Amir notes that he learned about the plot hole from Hassan, who couldn't even read. Moments later, Afghanistan changed forever. Chapter 5 There are bombs exploding and the sound of gunfire. Ali appears and says someone is duck hunting. Amir notes that the generation of Afghani children who are familiar with constant gunfire has not yet been born. Baba doesn't return until the following morning. Hassan and Amir remain inside all morning, but eventually head out to play. They encounter a neighborhood bully named Asif and his friends, Kamal and Wali. Asaf talks about the new order of things in Afghanistan since the coup of the previous night and predicts there is no room in the country for Amir's race. The situation turns violent, but Hassan pulls out a slingshot and threatens to put Asaf's left eye out. Asaf and his friends leave. A couple of years pass. One year, Baba buys the surgery to fix Hassan's cleft lip as a birthday gift. The surgery is a success, and Hassan is soon able to smile normally. As the chapter comes to a close, Amir notes that this is the year Amir stops smiling. Chapter 6 Winter Arrives Every youngster in Kabul loves winter because school is closed for the season, and it's time for kite flying along with the annual kite. Fighting Tournament Amir and Hassan make their own karmic. Amir and Hassan make their own kites, but there are always flaws with the designs. Baba begins buying their kites from Shoemaker, who is famous for his kites. Amir says a new kid in the neighborhood talks about the rules for the tournaments in the Hindu culture. Amir says the Afghanistan people hate rules and there are no rules for the tournament. The goal is to cut the strings of all the other kites without having your string cut. When a kite string is cut, the kite runners rush to retrieve it. Hassan is the best of all the runners, seldom looking up to see where the kite is headed, but always knowing where it will come down. The day of the tournament draws near and Baba predicts. Amir might win this year. Amir doesn't know how to react to the praise, but becomes determined to win. He says Baba wins at everything and has the right to expect Amir to win at this. Chapter 7 Amir is worried and almost decides not to fly his kite in the tournament at all, but Hassan convinces him to go ahead. Soon, there are only two kites remaining. Amir's and a blue kite flown by someone he doesn't know. When Amir makes the final cut, Setting the blue kite free from its string, the crowd goes wild. Hassan pledges to go retrieve the blue kite. Amir drags his kite in and Ali congratulates him. Amir doesn't yet go to his father, but imagines what the moment of congratulations will be. He believes this victory will change his relationship with his father and they will now live happily ever after. Amir goes in search of Hassan, and an old man says he say Hassan being chased by some boys. When Amir catches up, Hassan is trapped at the end of an alley. Asif is there with some friends. 
including a boy named Kamal. Asif says he forgives Hassan for the threats during their previous meeting, but the forgiveness comes with a price. He suggests Hassan hand over the blue kite. Hassan refuses and Asif says Amir would not make the same sacrifice for Hassan for Hassan. Hassan argues that he and Amir are friends, but Asif says Hassan is nothing more to Amir than a servant. He then says Hassan can keep the kite because that will remind him always of what I'm about to do. Asif then rapes Hassan while the other two boys hold Hassan down. Amir steps back from the entrance of the alley. He knows that he has one final chance to stand up for Hassan, but he slips away without revealing his presence. Amir says that perhaps this is the price he has to pay to win Baba's favor and that it might be a fair price. Amir waits for a while, then heads to the alley. He says he'd been looking for Hassan and their eyes don't meet. Amir pretends he doesn't see the tiny drops that fell from between his legs and stained the snow black or that he's limping. When they reach home, Baba is thrilled with Amir's victory. Chapter 8 Hassan and Amir barely see each other for the next week. One day, Ali asks Amir why Hassan is acting strangely. Amir says he doesn't know. A few days later, Amir goes on an outing with Beba and a group of friends and relatives. Amir says he finally has Baba's attention, but now he simply feels empty. Amir and Hassan stop spending time playing together, and Amir rebuffs Hassan's attempts. One day, Amir and Baba are planting tulips in the garden, and Amir asks if Baba had ever considered hiring someone else as the household servants. Baba is furious, citing his 40-year relationship with Ali. He says he's ashamed of Amir's comments and that Hassan is not leaving. School starts, and Amir spends a great deal of time in his room. One day, Amir asks Hassan to accompany him to their favorite reading spot. Amir is about to read, then stops and throws a pomegranate at Hassan. It strikes him and splatters. Amir screams at Hassan to hit him back, but Hassan refuses. Baba throws an elaborate birthday party for Amir when he turns 13. Amir notes that his relationship with his father is already regressing with distance between them again. While the party is for Amir's birthday, he knows that his father is the star of the show and the reason most of the people show up. Asif shows up with a book about Hitler as his gift to Amir. Amir is standing alone away from the party when Rahim Khan seeks him out. He presents Amir with a journal for his stories. Rahim says he'd almost married a girl once, but she was a servant and his parents would never have accepted her. He reminds Amir that he's open to anything Amir wants to talk about, and Amir almost tells him about Hassan's attack and his own reaction to it. But the moment passes as fireworks begin. During one blast that lights up the yard, Amir sees Hassan serving drinks to Asif and his friend. Chapter 9 Baba's two gifts are a red bicycle that would have been welcomed a few months earlier and a fancy wristwatch. The only gift Amir treasures is the journal from Rahim Khan. Amir becomes convinced that things would be better for Hassan if he were not in the house so that he would be far removed from Asif. But Amir also admits his life would be better without Hassan's presence. The next day, Amir hides some money and the watch under Hassan's mattress. He tells his father that the watch is missing and hints that Hassan might have taken it. Baba summons Hassan, Amir, and Ali to his office. Hassan admits to stealing the watch, and Amir realizes this is Hassan's way of protecting Amir one final time. Baba says he forgives Hassan, but Ali says life is no longer tolerable for them and that they are leaving. Baba rants. But Ali stands firm in the decision, and they leave the following day for Ali's cousin's house in Hazaraja. Chapter 10 This chapter takes place in March of 1981. 
Amir and Baba are in the back of a truck with several other people fleeing Afghanistan. They left the house behind with almost all their possessions, telling only Rahim that they were fleeing for America. They are stopped at a checkpoint, and a soldier demands time, along with a young mother in the truck as payment for passage. Baba intercedes, though Amir knows he's putting them all in danger by standing up for the young woman. A superior officer intervenes and the situation passes. The trip takes weeks with days hidden in basements along the way. Amir encounters Kamal, one of Asif's friends who had held Hasef's friends, who had held Hassan during the attack. Amir overhears Kamal's father saying that Kamal had been raped. He now reacts and responds to nothing. They make part of their journey in a tanker, and Kamal dies on the way. When his father realizes that Kamal is dead, he grabs a gun and kills himself as well. Chapter 11 takes place in Fremont, California, in the 1980s. Baba is working at a gas station. He is having trouble identifying with American customs and rules. Amir is studying. One day, Amir suggests that they return to Peshawar because it was more like Afghanistan and Baba was happier during their time there. Baba says he came to America for Amir and they are staying. The day Amir graduates high school, at the age of 20, Baba gives him a navy blue Gran Torino. Amir announces his plan to study creative writing. Baba isn't happy with the choice, wishing for a stable career instead. In 1983, Baba sells his old car and buys a beat-up Volkswagen bus. They begin hitting yard sales whenever there was extra time and selling the items at a regular Saturday flea market for a modest profit. There are lots of Afghanistan refugees at the flea market. And Baba loves to roam the stalls, visiting and sharing gossip. Many of the other sellers are former professionals, ranging from teachers to surgeons. One day, Baba introduces Amir to General Sahib, Mr. Iqbal Tahiri, a former member of the Ministry of Defense. Baba brags that Amir is going to be a great writer and that he's a straight-A student. He soon meets the general's wife and their daughter. Soraya. Later, Amir asks Baba about Soraya. He says there is gossip that she was involved with a young man and that the situation ended badly, but that she's hardworking and kind. Baba points out that life may be unfair toward women, but that her indiscretion means there are no now suitors looking for her hand in marriage. Chapter 12 Amir lives for the Sundays at the flea market, but he has trouble working up the nerve to actually talk to Soraya. Baba warns Amir to be careful not to harm Soraya's honor or that of her father. Amir soon learns that Soraya wants to be a teacher, though her father wishes for her to have a more lucrative career. Baba becomes ill and a doctor discovers a spot on his lung that is later diagnosed as oat cell carcinoma. The cancer is advanced and inoperable. Baba insists that no one learn of his illness. One day, he collapses at the flea market with a seizure and is hospitalized. Two days later, he's released from the hospital. It's obvious that he has only a little time left. Amir asks Baba to speak to Soraya's father, asking for permission for them to marry. Soraya telephones Amir that evening. She says her father has given his permission, but she needs to tell him something first. She and a young man had lived together for a short while. She fears that this fact will mean Amir won't want to marry her after all though he's hurt by the fact that she has already been to bed with another man he knows that he can't hold her past against her he says he wants to marry her anyway chapter 13 the traditions related to the upcoming marriage continue the ceremonies would normally have lasted several months but everyone can see that baba isn't likely to live that long so the event is hastened 
Soraya becomes Baba's chief caregiver, and he is almost completely bedridden in their apartment. One day, Amir arrives home to find the two of them looking guilty as Soraya tries to hide something. He discovers it's the journal given to him by Rahim Khan. Soraya says she hadn't realized the depth of his talent. Baba says he put her up to it. That night, Baba says he is in no pain for the first time in a long time. He declines the pain medication and dies that night. Amir begins to learn about his in-laws. The general is a tyrant who rules with anger. Kala Jamila, Soraya's mother, is kind and gentle with a beautiful singing voice. Though the general refuses to allow her sing in public, though the general refuses to allow her sing in public, Amir and Soraya move to a one-bedroom apartment near her parents. They stop going to the flea market and focus on their studies. Amir spends more time writing and sells a book. They try to have a child. After a year, a doctor tells them Soraya will never be able to conceive. They discuss adoption, but Amir can tell Soraya's heart isn't in it and drops the idea. They use the money from Amir's second book to put a down payment on a house. Their lives settle into a routine, but Amir can feel the absence of a child in their lives. He compares it to a present settling between us, like a newborn child. Chapter 14 This chapter begins in June of 2001. Amir has a phone call from Rahim Khan, who is in Pakistan. Rahim says that he is very ill. Amir plans to leave for Pakistan immediately. Amir plans to leave for Pakistan immediately. Amir says that Ram Khan had said during their phone call that there is a way to be good again. Amir knows this means Rahim has always knows about Hassan's attack, Amir's lack of action, and Amir's lies that forced Hassan out of his home. Time has changed many things in their lives. The general is no longer critical of Soraya's chosen profession and sometimes sits in on her classes. Chapter 15 Amir arrives and is surprised at Rahim Khan's gaunt appearance. Rahim says in keeping with an agreement with Baba, he'd moved into their house once Amir and Baba left Afghanistan. Rahim says he couldn't bring himself to leave his home even when things were bad. He then says he has a story he needs to tell Amir. Chapter 16 Rahim Khan says he was traveling one day when he encountered Hassan. Hassan was married by then. At first, he and his wife were reluctant to leave the home they had created for themselves. However, Rahim convinced them, and they moved in with him. They took care of the house and Rahim. Hassan's wife, Farzana, gave birth to a stillborn daughter. She was pregnant again when a strange woman appeared. She was near death and they began to nurse her back to health before discovering she was Hassan's mother, Sanabar. Sanabar. Sanabar Zana gave birth to a son they named Sorab. When Sorab was four, Sanabar died. Chapter 17 Rahim Khan continues the story, but first he gives Amir a faded photo of Hassan as an adult with a son as an adult with a little boy, Sorab. There is also a letter from Hassan. He explains that Rahim Khan is ill and that the situation in his country is degrading quickly. He reminisces, updates Amir on his life, and says that if Amir ever returns to his home in Afghanistan, he'll find Hassan waiting faithfully. Rahim Khan says the letter was written six months earlier. He says one day, a group of Taliban soldiers arrived at the house and demanded Hassan and his family leave. Hassan protested, and the soldiers executed him in the street. When Farzania ran toward her dead husband, the soldiers killed her as well. Rahim Khan says the Taliban soldiers now live in the house and that Sohrab has been taken in orphanage. Rahim says a local couple will take Sohrab in if Amir can get him into Pakistan. Amir offers to pay for someone else to go, but Rahim Khan explodes, telling Amir that it's time for him to stand up as a man and do what's right. 
He then goes on to tell the rest of his story. He says Ali was married to another woman before Sanabar. They had no children, but when she left Ali, she had three daughters. Rahim Khan says Ali was not able to father children. Amir initially argues, but then gives in and asks for the identity of Hassan's father. Rahim Khan says Amir knows if he will just think on the matter. Amir doesn't want to accept it, but he realizes Baba is also Hassan's father and that he and Hassan are half-brothers, making Soharb his nephew. Chapter 18 Amir spends some time wishing Rahim Khan hadn't called him and that he'd continued his life in America without knowing what happened to Hassan. But he announces he will go find Sorab and instructs Rahim Khan to call the Caldwells, the couple who have agreed to accept Sofrab once he's out of Afghanistan. Chapter 19 Amir is paired up with a man named Farid, who will provide transportation and guidance on his quest to find Sorab. They spend the night at Farid's house and Amir eats a meal. Farid's sons stare at him, and he gives them his watch, only to discover later that there hadn't been enough food in the house for his meal and for the children. He leaves money under a mattress, knowing they would not accept it from him otherwise. Chapter 20 They arrive in Amir's neighborhood, and he's appalled at the devastation. In a chance encounter, Amir meets a former teacher who is now a homeless beggar. The man remembers Amir's mother and says she'd confided in him that she was profoundly happy, so much so that she was afraid something would be taken from her. Amir has to leave, but realizes this old man has given him more information about his mother than his father ever did. They arrive at an orphanage where they believe Saurabh is living. At first, the director claims to know nothing about Saurabh, but eventually admits that he's been taken captive by a Taliban soldier who periodically demands a child as payment for the safety of the orphanage as a whole. Saurabh has been gone for a month, he tells them. How to find the man who took Saurabh? Chapter 21 Amir asks Farid to drive through his old neighborhood, and they stop at his house. He stays until Farid reminds him they are in danger by being there. Then, he goes to a hotel where he rents a room for an incredibly high price. He starts to argue, but realizes the man isn't being greedy. He's simply trying to feed his family. They go the next day to the soccer game, where the orphanage director tells them they'll find the man who took Sorba. The soldier, who Amir later discovers, is Asef, appears at halftime and stones a man and woman to death. Farid tells one of the Taliban soldiers that he and Amir want a meeting with the soldier in charge of the stoning. Amir is surprised when he's told where to go at 3 o'clock that same day. Chapter 22 They arrive at the big house where the meeting is to be held, and Amir says, he doesn't expect Farid to go inside with him. He immediately notices that Asif hasn't changed clothes since the execution that day, and that needle marks on his forearms identify him as a drug user. Asif begins to taunt Amir, asks why he left Afghanistan for America rather than staying to fight for his country. Asif calls in Saurab as who wearing bells that jingle when he walks. He is forced to dance, and he does so in something like a trance, apparently knowing he'll be punished otherwise. Amir is amazed at the resemblance to Hassan. After Sorab's dance, Amir realizes the soldier holding him captive is Asef. Amir offers to pay for him, but Asef refuses money. He says he'll fight Amir with the winner taking Sorab. Amir agrees. Asif tells the other soldiers to leave the room and that they aren't to enter no matter what they hear. He says if Amir walks out of the room with Sorab, they are to allow him to leave unharmed. Amir says, looking back on the fight, he's certain he didn't give Asif a good run because he'd never been in a fight before. While he's being severely beaten, 
he suddenly feels cleansed of all the guilt and he begins to laugh. Sorab intervenes, telling Asif to stop. He has a small brass ball taken from the base of a table in the slingshot aimed at Asif. Asif releases Amir and lunges for Sorab, who fires, striking Asif in the left eye so hard that his eye is displaced and blood begins to run. Sorab and Amir leave the room and the soldiers, remembering the orders. Allow them to go. Farid is waiting outside. Chapter 23 Amir wakes briefly in a hospital, then passes out again. He wakes several more times, each time with brief impressions. When he finally is coherent, he learns he had his spleen removed, his lung was punctured, and his jaw is wired shut. He learns that Farid has been taking care of Sora. He later discovers that the Caldwells don't actually exist. Rahim Khan has left a letter for Amir and disappeared. Two important aspects of the letter are that he has always known about Amir's failure to help Hassan and that he has always known about Baba's failure to claim Hassan as his biological son. Rahim Khan goes into details about both, saying Amir has always been too hard on himself for that mistake and that Baba treated Amir badly because he was never able to openly claim both his sons. The letter goes on to say that Rahim has left most of the money to Amir to help with expenses related to getting out of the country with Sorab. The letter ends with a plea for Amir to forgive Rahim Khan, forgive his father, and forgive his father, and forgive himself. Amir continues to heal slowly, and Farid says he isn't sure how long Amir will be safe from the Taliban in this location. Amir and Saurabh begin spending more time together as Amir considers his options. Farid drives Amir and Saurabh when they leave the hospital and head to Islamabad. Amir sleeps most of the way, but considers Rahim's words that there is a way to be good again. Chapter 24 They arrive in Islamabad and get a hotel room. Farid leaves them saying he needs to return to his family. Amir spends the night wondering when his physical injuries will be healed and wondering what he'll do with Saurabh, though he admits that he already knows he'll take him to America. Amir sleeps. And when he wakes, Saurabh is gone. He recalls that Saurabh had been enthralled with a mosque a short distance away and finds him there. Saurabh is struggling with the fact that he injured Asif, he says. Hassan taught him that it's always wrong to hurt someone because even a bad person can change. Amir says that Hassan had saved Amir when they were children and Asif threatened to harm Amir. He says, Asif later hurt Hassan. Saurab asks if Hassan would be disappointed in Saurab for hurting Asif. Amir assures him Hassan would be proud of Saurab for saving Amir's life. They talk about San Francisco and Saurab begins to seem excited about the prospect of moving to America. One night, Saurab asks what will happen to him in America if Amir becomes tired of him or Soraya doesn't like him. Amir promises neither of those things will happen. Amir calls Soraya, who has been frantic with worry. He relates the story of Saurabh and says he wants to adopt the boy. Soraya hesitates only a moment before saying Amir should bring Saurabh home with him. Amir goes to the American embassy where he meets a man named Raymond Andrews. Raymond explains that the biggest hurdle is to prove that Sohrab's parents are truly dead. Without death certificates or some proof that Amir is now Sohrab's legal guardian, the adoption won't be approved. He says Sohrab will not likely be allowed to leave the country. Amir calls Soraya with the news. She has been working with a friend who promises to help through Inns Channels. Meanwhile, Amir reaches out to a local attorney who says the best option is to leave Amir in an orphanage in the country while the details are worked out. The attorney says the options include seeking political asylum for Sorab, but it would require proving that Sorab is being persecuted. 
Amir could also live in Pakistan for two years while the local adoption is approved. The attorney says the best option is for Sohrab to remain in a Pakistan orphanage while Amir returns home to begin the adoption process from there. Amir begins to talk with Saurabh, telling him that the best option for the adoption to take place seems to be that Saurabh will remain in Pakistan in an orphanage for a short time. Saurabh begins to cry, pleading with Amir not to leave him in another orphanage. Sorab has developed a habit of taking a long bath each night and Soraya calls while he's in the tub. She says their friend has a plan, getting Sorab into the country on a visitation visa and making the adoption official while he's there. After the call, Amir goes to the bathroom to tell Sorab the good news. Sorab has slashed his wrists with a razor blade and the Amir is still screaming when the ambulance arrives. Chapter 25 Amir can see the doctors working on Sarab, but they won't allow him in the room. For five hours, he waits for news. He falls asleep and a medical official wakes him. Amir learns Sorab has a transfusion and was revived twice, but is alive and stable. Amir remains at Sarab's bedside almost every minute after that. When Saurabh is released from the intensive care unit, Amir rushes to the motel to get clean clothes. The owner tells him he has to leave because the situation is bad for business. Amir says he understands and takes his things. Amir says he understands and takes his things. At the hospital, Saurabh is on suicide watch. When Saurabh is awake, Amir talks to him, promising that Saurabh will go with him to America and that he's safe. Amir begins to read with him in one day. Sorab begins to read with him in one day. Sorab interrupts saying he's tired. Amir says it's to be expected, but Sorab says he's tired of everything. He says he wants his old life back, including his parents, and that he wishes he had died. Amir stays with Sorab and has no clue at that moment that Sorab won't say another word for almost a year. Amir asks Saurabh to go with him to America. Saurabh simply doesn't respond one way or the other, and Amir makes the travel arrangements. Saraya greets Saurabh with affection, but he remains indifferent. She has made a guest room into a bedroom for him. Saraya's mother presents him a sweater she knitted. He is silent through it all. Saraya's father says people will want to know why Saurabh is here. Amir says he will tell people Sorab is his nephew. Sorab withdraws completely. Every action is done automatically, in silence, and without enthusiasm. Soraya and Amir had discussed their plans for Sorab prior to his arrival. Soraya wanted to enroll him in soccer and swimming. The reality is that Sorab sleeps most of the time and seems to care nothing at all about life. Then the Twin Towers are targeted and Afghanistan is bombed. While Saurabh shows no interest, Amir and Soraya become active in relief efforts for the Afghanistan victims of landmines and other casualties of the fighting there. Another year arrives. Soraya and Amir are in their living room quietly watching TV, while Saurabh is silent upstairs. As time passes, people become less interested in Sorab and stop talking about the poor mute boy whenever they are in gatherings. In March of 2002, Soraya and Amir are at a gathering of Afghan people at Lake Elizabeth Park in Fremont. By now, the general has returned to Afghanistan to hold a ministry position and Soraya's mother, Kala Jamila, is staying with Amir and Soraya in his absence. It's a rainy day early, but the rain slacks off by midday and Amir spots a man selling a kite. He buys one and asks Saurabh to join him in flying it. Saurabh is silent. Amir says that Saurabh's father had been the best kite runner in all of Afghanistan when they were children. Amir says it appears he'll have to fly this particular kite alone and he gets it airborne. When he stops running, he realizes Sorab is beside him. He hands Sorab the kite string and they are soon joined by another kite.
and Amir knows there's gonna be a battle. Solrob gives control of the kite back to Amir and Amir talks, telling Solrob about Hassan's favorite tactic in a kite tournament. At the right time, Amir makes the move and cuts the string of the other kite. People in the park begin to cheer, and Solrob is smiling slightly. Amir asks Solrob if he should run the kite. He believes he sees Solrob nod. Amir takes off among the group of children. He knows the actions of Saurabh that day are not a huge step in the right direction, but he believes they are a step. He accepts that. 